Okay. Hello, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for taking time to attend. On behalf of All India Oracle Clusers Group, a very warm welcome to AIOG weekly webinar series. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I think most of you know about All India Oracle Clusers Group. Uh, AIOG is a platform where you can share, gain the knowledge, and network with fellow Oracle community members. Not only that, uh, we are requesting our community members to share your feedback and also experience about Oracle products while networking with uh, like-minded peers. Um, as you know, we are running the theme-based events. Uh, this month is really exceptional for many of us. Uh, maximum Availability Architecture Online Summit. The summit series uh, consists of nine events. It is essential to attend all the events and ask the right questions closer to the topic. A huge thanks to Anil and Marcus for putting this together. They are the big supporter of community, especially AIOG. So please ask all your burning questions. Uh, one small request, please check the session title and abstract from the events page and try to keep your questions closer to the topic. Uh, use uh, valuable time of speakers. And I think you know the drill. Uh, please ask all your questions in the Q&A bottom of your screen. Uh, and also ask if you need any general questions in the chat box. And also it's important to that, uh, take a screenshot of any of the uh, presentation slide and post it in uh, Twitter so that your connections also know about this uh, particular summit. And also it's, uh, it's the only way you can make a virtual networking. Uh, it's important to make uh, more connections these days. I don't know how many days, months, years we are going to work like this. So it's important to build your virtual connections. And we will upload the presentation material um, in the AOG website by tomorrow. Please uh, access from there and provide us uh, your feedback uh, at any, any time. And it's important to join our Telegram group. I'll share. So you can see this uh, Telegram group. Uh, it's the quickest way to get a, a quick response from us. So with that, a very warm welcome to today's speakers. I'm sure no introduction required for both of the speakers, but it is good to introduce their profiles so you can understand the uh, breadth and depth of their areas of expertise. Uh, so you can see Marcus. Uh, Marcus has been with uh, Oracle for 20 years in various positions. Uh, he's currently a vice president with Oracle America and manages Oracle database high availability, scalability, maximum availability architecture, and cloud migration product management team, which is part of Oracle database development. Using database technologies, his team has helped ensure 24 by 7 availability of critical high throughput OLTP and data warehouse database systems around the world transformed the way Oracle customers get experience of Oracle database on-premises, as well as when they're moving into a cloud using a zero downtime migration, right? So uh, you, as you guys know how important this uh, topics uh, comes under uh, a maximum availability architecture, I'm sure most of you DBS uh, hit Oracle rack at least uh, once in a, your lifetime. So it's a beautiful product. Uh, no competitor is providing that particular uh, thing. So, uh, so please uh, ask all your burning questions related to uh, maximum availability ar architecture. So the next speaker, uh, I think most of you know, he's our uh, monthly speaker, Anil Nair. Um, Anil has been involved with database high availability and scalability for the last 25 years. Anil started his career supporting mission critical applications for Oracle products like Oracle Parallel Server, OPS, and Data Guard. He spent uh, some time as a developer for Oracle Engineered System team and today is a product manager for Oracle Real Application Cluster. Aside from technical aspects, Anil enjoys playing cricket and he uh, now to spend week weekends playing cricket and weekdays playing tennis. So. I request uh, everyone to follow Anil and Marcus in social media to find more. Uh, so with that, I'm handing over to uh, uh, Marcus to please go ahead and share your presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Sai. I'm sharing, I hope. Can you see the presentation? Yes, thank you. Good. 
Well, thank you so much, Sai, for this lovely introduction. I don't think there's anything to add, especially as Sai already picked up uh, on some aspects of what we want to talk uh, talk about today. Anil will be um, answering all your questions, I hope, in chat. We will hopefully have some time in the end of this presentation to answer them live, but majorly we will go through the chat and Anil will be manning the chat and I'll be presenting today. And what are we presenting on? We are presenting on the top five reasons to deploy your applications on Oracle Rack. And this presentation is really a presentation for developers, DBAs, and managers. You know, I'm not implying any order here. You can see what order will come out later, but really it's a combination presentation. I wanna address certain aspects that might be interesting for these different groups of people within the same company. With that, welcome to our session today. Um, and let's get started. As you know, um, when it comes to high availability uh, and scalability solutions, customers and you and partners have choices. And that is not only if you look at the grow of the database, you even have choices within the scope of the Oracle database. Sai formerly mentioned, or just a minute ago mentioned that Rack has no competitor, competitor in the market, and I fully agree with this. But to some degree, there are alternatives um, to the benefits that Oracle Rack provides, scalability and high availability be the major ones. And so if you look at these alternatives, this is really what we want to discuss today is why do you want to use Oracle Rack? Now, what are those alternatives? Luckily, a friend of ours, Chris Kraft, and a teammate of Anil's and mine, has recently published an article or a blog post these days on, on, on the Oracle Exadata block, which discusses horizontal scalability of the database. And I have taken some of the pictures he has provided there to explain some general differences and some general choices, simplified, um, of high availability and scalability solutions that you have within the scope, only within the scope of the Oracle database. And the first one that I wanna mention here is native sharding also otherwise known as Oracle sharding, but as we are only speaking about the Oracle database, it's native Oracle sharding, so to speak. And Oracle sharding is a shared nothing architecture. We've had it since Oracle 12C. And what it basically does is it takes different or separate, here it says separate physical databases, that could be a single instance, could also be a rack, but separate physical databases and combines them to one logical database. The way this is done is by sharding. So across these separate physical databases, you would shard your data, which is basically partition your data. So each shard contains a subset of the data that makes up the full set of the database, which is then presented to you in a logical view as one logical database. The sharding concept is a new, it has been around for a while and Oracle has adopted it, as I said, with 12C. And sharding is a very useful, um, architecture because it not only provides you a very good high availability, for example, if a shard fails, you only lose a percentage of the data. Let's assume your data is equally distributed. And as in my picture here, you have eight shards. Then if one shard fails, you only lose an eighth of the data. Now that could still be very critical, which is why you can protect shards individually. That means if you have a shard, which is a you know, separate physical database, you can protect it by rack uh, using data guard, or Golden Gate or any other of the high availability solution that Oracle provides. The other thing is that um, Sharding provides near linear, actually it provides linear scalability, near linear is the other solution, um, linear scalability by adding and removing shards as demand requires it. So, you know, removing isn't probably a part of scalability, but if you need to serve more users or more data or both, you can add shards to your sharded database and it will linearly scale. The only draw side then is why does it linearly scale when you add shards? Because the application needs to be aware that your database is sharded. Now, for some use cases, that isn't a draw side at all. Um, but if, if you have a standard application which doesn't understand sharding, making that application sharding or shard, sharding aware may be a bit of a challenge. For new applications, you probably have a choice, but be, be, bear in mind that if you use sharding, and that goes across all sharding solutions, but only for the Oracle database, 
your application needs to understand that you're using a sharded database. You need to provide what is called a sharding key, which is basically the key by which you distributed the data in the sharded database in the first place. So therefore, you know, sharded databases require some application um, compliance or some application cooperation, so to speak. Um, and Oracle native sharding has some features to make it easier, but yet there is a fundamental requirement for that. Oracle real application clusters, on the other hand, is fundamentally different from, uh, different from Oracle sharding in that it uses a shared disk architecture, which I'm showing here in the middle of the picture. And all database instances, that is the memory and the processes that are allocated on a server access the same database on their shared storage and database here is defined then as the files and the data files on, on disk. They can concurrently access all, all the data files. So the data is always in access between all instances and database instances can share data in between. We certainly will talk about this later in this presentation. Just one little um, explanation, REC1 node is so to speak the small brother of REC1, uh, of REC which means it has only one instance, REC1 node, one instance running for most of the time. Therefore, it's not a scalability, but a high availability solution that provides failover protection, although it does have a downtime when it fails over and you can use it to optimize rolling patching. Now, the difference between sharding and REC is also in that, as I mentioned for sharding, the application needs to know that you're using a sharded database and needs to connect to the shard in which the data resides, which it wants to access. That is why the application needs to provide the sharding key in case of a sharded data, a database. In Oracle RAC, the, the idea is fundamentally different. The application can connect anywhere in the cluster on any instance that it wants. There are mechanisms that we will speak about that make it more transparent to where the application will connect to. But once connected, the database and the REC database in itself across all instances will ensure that data is delivered to wherever the connection request has been made to whatever instance an application is connected and makes a certain request. So in REC, um, the database needs to deliver the data to where it's been needed. In the sharding case, it's more or less that the application goes where the data is residing. For that reason, REC scales nearly linearly. This overhead in providing data costs us a few percentage points when it comes to linear scaling. So we are nearly linear scaling, but we really are transparent with REC to applications and therefore can be used with many more applications without changes. And that will be one of the things we're going to talk about today. Just for completeness, there is a third high availability scalability solution to some degree, which um, in Oracle's world is based on active data guard, data guard or active data guard, minor difference for the time being. Um, and what is lately more often called read replicas. Data Guard is more than 20 years old, and we have always called it Data Guard, by which you have one primary database, which then feeds the data that changes on the primary to the standby databases, thereby synchronizes the databases con continuously with change data. We use read or change vectors to send over to the standbys, they are applied, and we do in, um, allow for um, zero data loss with data guard in that, you know, the standby databases will confirm the receipt of the change vector and then um, confirm this to the standby and only then a transaction that has been initiated on the standby will be flagged as committed. So thereby it's a very flexible solution. And once you have the data replicated into one to N, here it is five uh, standby databases, you could use those standby databases for read operations. That is part in Oracle um, of the active data guard option. But once you have the active data guard option enabled, you can open up the standby for reads. And you could even perform with DML redirect a few updates on the standby, but I will come to that maybe in another presentation. The main focus here is that once you have standby databases, they can act as read replicas. And read replicas means that you can you know, read on them and run reports on them. That is a scalability solution if you're only concerned about reads because in this particular paradigm, you cannot scale further because writes don't scale over replicas because you have a write per replica. So that doesn't really scale so well. These are the fundamental three concepts that we will talk about today. There are more ideas that you could um, 
have when it comes to horizontally scaling your Oracle database. Um, Golden Gate would be another one, which is kind of a multi a master replication. And if you are interested in this, I encourage you follow this link to read that blog, but not for the next 30 minutes, because we would much rather like to talk about the top five reasons to deploy your applications on Oracle Rack. And the five top reasons I came up with, and you know, so did Anil, but you know, as I'm presenting, um, the first one is developer productivity. And that is really focusing on new applications, on new projects. It's really easy to develop a new application based on Rack, not because it's Rack, but also because it's an Oracle database. You can start on an Oracle single instance database with your application. And if you'd like to increase scalability and high availability later, because you don't want to make that the first thought when you start to develop an application, you can do it because Oracle Rack and all the high availability features around them are transparent. And I will elaborate what that means for productivity of developers in the first point. The other points there for uh, two to five are then supporting, but also give a different light on certain aspects. For example, Oracle Rack provides integrated scalability. What I mean by that is that we not only scale, but we are very integrated with a lot of applications, with other components that make up the whole infrastructure, as well as with other features. Oracle Rack scales every feature, and we'll talk about this in detail. Oracle Rack also provides seamless high availability, and not only for the application that sits on top of the database, but to a certain degree for the whole stack, and we will talk about that. And then we will go over into more advanced features that you could use in conjunction with or on top of Oracle Rack, which is isolated consolidation, for example. It's a little bit of a wordplay here, but really Rack is a good consolidation platform, especially because it provides isolation if you happen to combine different use cases. So for converged use cases, that is particularly interesting. And we will show you a few items how this will reflect in the Oracle, Arch Oracle Rack architecture. Last but not least, at least, it's very flexible. I hope by the time we reach point number five, you will, have, uh, you will hopefully have seen this already. But just to show you in a more profound way there, it's fully flexible. You can choose when you use certain features, high availability, scalability features alike, where and how. But in order to talk about all of this in the 45 minutes that are remaining, let's start with number one, developer productivity. Now, when it comes to developer productivity, I have learned, and I will say this with a certain grain of salt because I'm not a developer by heart, may I be just honest. I can understand certain aspects. I've done my share of coding when I was perhaps a little bit younger, but frankly, um, I cannot speak to the entire need of developers when it comes to databases, except for one thing. When you want to deploy and develop a database application, then the first thing that you probably need to, know, uh, need to do is connect to a database. And when it comes to the Oracle database, the way you would do this is you use what it's called a TNS um, connector string. And that connector string tells your application or respectively the application server, if you go through an application server, um, it, it, it tells the application server and the database how the application wants and where to connect to it. And between Anil and I, we probably have seen, I don't know, hundreds of different combinations of TNS connector strings, and they all connect you to an Oracle database in the end. It's very easy to test, right? You write the connector string, and in the end, you run it, and you can either connect or you can't. So uh, it's, it's rather easy to find out. The way, whether, the way it connects to the database and whether it's the most effective that, however, differs on exactly the configuration you use, exactly the parameters you use within the connector string. And based on loads and loads of experience between many, many people in Oracle, external to Oracle and our MAA team, Maximum Availability Architecture team, we have come up what I would call the TNS connector string for high availability, uh, high availability and scalability. And this connector string works particularly well with database 12.2 or later. It will work with former ones too. There are many, there's, there's a few um, parameters that may not work as it would be on a 12.2, but really with 12.2 and following or later databases, this really would work very well. Now, I don't have time to explain the whole 
um, connector string today to you. There's other presentations out there. Um, for example, the one that I have uh, linked over here that explained in a little bit more detail. But in short, what this connector string does is it's designed so that you can start with a single instance database, which in which case, as I say on the right side here, you would have only one host name here, right, in your address list. And if you have a rack, you just replace this host name with a primary scan. So the rack scan component, the single client access network component that the rack comes with, or as a host name on your first address list, that would be right here. And if you later on would like to add a data guard or even Golden Gate, but stay with the flow with data guard for a moment, you can add a secondary scan that assumes, however, you have a secondary a data guard on based on rack, or you have a single host name if it's a single instance. But you can see here by having different address list entries in this connector string, it's very modular. You can start with single instance, you can start with rack. That would be just a change in the host name structure. And then if you add data count later, you can add another address list. It's very simple. Now there is a whole bunch of parameters in the second line of the connector string here, which one could probably and probably need to explain and then could probably discuss for a while. I don't have the time in this presentation today, I'm afraid, but let me just tell you, while these numbers may look a little bit different than what you would have used at first glance, those are what I would call empirically determined numbers or values for those parameters that we recommend these days. These are strong recommendations because we have really looked into very, very many combinations of things. And we believe that these values for the respective parameters are the one that we should be using. And so should you there, but you know, if you look closer, depending on your scenario, they can certainly be tailored. So this is the connector string. And if you have a new database project and you want to develop an application against it, I strongly recommend you give that application project that connector string and you never, never give them the database name. From day one, the new application project should always get what we call database service names. So service names that are registered with Oracle Clusterware, for example, so that you can control the start and stop of the service and therefore the access to, uh, to the database through a particular application. If you do that, and if you use services as a main connectivity endpoint going forward, scalability and high availability and the connecti connectivity to a database that's scalable and high available will be very transparent for any new project and application. And that means once developers are connected, they can go straight to work. Because an Oracle database, I must really say, you don't have to worry about certain aspects that you have to worry about in other databases. For example, connecting against the right instance is nothing that developers have to worry about in an Oracle database. You use this connector string, as I said before, and the DBAs can help the developers to set it up. You see, it's a presentation for both groups. Um, you use this connector string, whether you have a single instance or a rec database, or you have a rec database in, or a single instance with DataGuard, this connector string will guide the application to the right destination. Whatever is available and most suited to take the connection at the time will take the connection. That's really how good this connector string is. Of course, certain limitations apply. Then if, for example, you are connected to REC database, you don't have to worry as an application developer to guide the application to the right instance as there isn't a right instance. Oracle REC will connect the application via server-side and server-side load balancing or client-side and server-side load balancing to the instance that is most suited to take a new connection at that very moment of time. Remember, it doesn't matter what the connection would do next. It doesn't matter what data has been requested by that connection once connected because Rack will deliver the data wherever the connection sits. So the only thing that our whole system needs to do is connect the application via client and server-side load balancing, which we have and which is transparent to the application, to the instance that is most suited in terms of utilization to take the next request at that moment in time. So there is no need to think about, there's also no need to think about ACID or these kind of things for developers. The Oracle database handles this. It's not on the slide. I just want to make it clear because other databases um, these days announce that they are ACID compatible 
well, the Oracle database has been as, as compatible for longer than I can think. We don't even say that anymore. That's why I'm saying it here. Now, as you are now connected, and hopefully you're connected via uh, to a red database, the next thing that developers don't need to think about then is scaling. Because in a red database, um, nodes can be added and removed transparently. And the system will make sure that newly added nodes will do new work that's coming in and removed nodes will not get assigned any node anymore. Unlike with sharding solution, where any adding and removal of shards need a resharding, so need to reshuffle the data, we don't need to do this in REC. In REC, all the data is in a single destination, it's in the shared storage, and the nodes are just a means of scaling. And as you add nodes or remove nodes, if you have set up the system as I have so far assumed, any new node will be used transparently and any removed node will not be used any further. You can have different CPU and memory allocation in a node. You as a developer don't need to necessarily tailor to any of this. The memory and CPU allocation management is fully transparent in an Oracle Rack database, also in a, on a single instance database. However, DBAs may make sure that the nodes do not deviate too much in terms of memory and CPU. Um, because it would be good to have instances behave sim somewhat alike, but to some degree it's fully supported to mix and match, so to speak. So if you don't go crazy with deviation, you can actually even utilize bigger nodes by allocating certain workload there, and it will be done automatically anyway because we have a load balancing mechanism in the REC database. So it's, it's allowed to do this, it's supported. Uh, I just wanted to clarify this, this is one of the things that People often say REC wouldn't support. It's, it's supported. It's just not um, ideal if it's deviating too far or too much. We also have parallelism in the Oracle database. We have parallelism that can be used within one server vertically. And then we have also one that allows us to horizontally scale. I will be talking about this in more detail later, but parallel execution can be set in any Oracle database, including REC databases, independently of the application. So yet another area that uh, developers don't have to think about just develop your application, we will do the parallelization. And last but not least, availability is not something the data developers developing an application for the Oracle REC and Oracle database need to think about. There is no coding failure for, for failures required. There is no retries or um, 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 coding against in-flight uh, in operations failing required. We will, if you choose to do that, we will um, rerun in-flight transactions that fail, so transactions that haven't committed at the moment of failure, we will rerun them for you and bring them to a complete on the failover instance. That is optional via application continuity, which is free with RAC. Now, if you have an application that is very, very um, time sensitive and response time sensitive, you can still code your retries, you can still code your failures. But if, if, if that is not your case. If you don't need to be very particular about this area, then you don't have that requirement. You can, re uh, you can rely on application continuity to take that over for you. Now, once you're connected against an Oracle database, you also benefit from all the great inherent Oracle database features. And in the context of application development, one that I want to point out is Hang Manager. Hang Manager has been around since 11.107. It's enabled by default, and it does exactly what the name implies, a little bit better than the name implies, perhaps. It manages hangs. It manages hangs in a way that it detects them and resolves them. So it's not just telling you that you have a hang. It also resolves them. And it resolves them in, in different ways, meaning to say it can be more sensitive or a little less sensitive. As you increase a hang manager sensitivity, it means as it detects a hang, it may you know, resolve that hang by killing a process for the first part sooner if you say, well, we got to be a little bit aggressive here. Normally, hang manager makes sure that a hang is really a hang as opposed to a very slow progression of things. That is a very difficult part here. When your application um, is working and is connected and do something, the database doesn't know whether perhaps the application is just slowly pro progressing or it's really hung. To determine whether it's a hang, you need to run more than one verification round, which is um, illustrated in the picture on the right. So if you need that application to much 
you know, to be very careful about when processes are killed, you want to have a low sensitivity. So you're saying, or normal, that would be our term for it. You say, okay, let's make sure there is a hang before you kill anything. But sometimes um, customers have said, well, we need to, that application to continue in another instance if it's really too slow. So let's be a little bit more aggressive. That is a high sensitivity. And then you can you know, progress and kill a, a process and therefore free up resources, fail over to another instance potentially, and then continue that workload. So Hang Manager is really good in resolving hangs. It will also protocol whatever he, it has found and done. So it will protocol any hang that has potentially been detected, whether it's got resolved automatically or whether it has taken action so that it has resolved it. Since ADNC, Oracle Hang Manager also takes care of deadlocks. So that means that you know, if your application by chance creates a deadlock, we will take care of this in the Oracle database as much as we will have done it. We would have done it with a hang. And we not only do this within the database, this is very important for the DBAs to know. If you have a REC database based on ASM, which is normally the case, then Hang Manager will also resolve hangs that perhaps are internal, as you could think about it, between ASM and the database. So there is really a good protection that you get with Hang Manager and you get it all automatically. And for developers, you don't have to think about anymore how to resolve dead logs or hangs, the database is gonna do it for you. Last but not least, if your workload changes over time, or if your system changes over time, since 12.2 Hang Manager, it's auto-tuning auto itself. So that means even if your developer continues to develop the application and the behavior of the application changes, or maybe the application gets more uh, in demand and therefore the system is under higher load, Hang Manager will detect those things and auto tune itself to take them into consideration. Again, it comes back to the fact where, how do I determine whether it's a slow progression or really a hang? Hang Manager does take into account how the system is health-wise overall. And if it's in high demand, it may consider that and say, well, maybe it's a slow progression rather than a hang, let me verify that explicitly. So there is really a lot of protection that you get from these features that we have in the Oracle database. Now, if you are developing a new application, and I make this very clear because there's a distinction between existing applications and new applications been developed. And if you are therefore a developer, um, there are certain optimizations that you can make once you develop an application against the REC database in particular. It's not absolutely required. I'll show you later why it isn't, but as you are perhaps also developing for new workload, we would really encourage you to not use DBM pipes, but use advanced queuing instead, right? So this would be one of the things. Pipes don't really work that well with Rack. They can be made work, but you know, to manage them in case of a failover probably outweighs the benefits of pipes, whereas advanced queues and the advanced queuing that Oracle offers um, is way more efficient here. And it also has been improved, particularly in Oracle Database 19C for the use in conjunction with Oracle Rack. So you really may want to look into that. Now, the other thing that you want to look into is perhaps using scalable sequences. This is, again, a topic that we can talk about at length. But in short, what it means is if you have the need to create an, a, a, an increasing number, for example, for orders or builds, the best you can use is a sequence. There are alternatives, so don't get me wrong, but in Oracle terms, a sequence would be good, and it should be non-ordered and cached. Even that kind of sequence still has some difficulties to really work sometimes, especially if it's ordered, despite it being cached. So what we recommend to use with uh, 18C and later is scalable sequences. Scalable sequences combine another piece of information uh, into the sequence generation. It's not visible, but it just helps to distinguish the, uh, the, the increased number so that we wouldn't run, for example, into a right index rows problem. So using scalable in, uh, sequences will prevent, hopefully, uh, to the most part, right uh, growing index problems, which can and are known to be a scalability inhibitor for certain cases in Oracle Rack. So it's really a good thing. And if you haven't heard about those, please do look them up in the documentation. Now, when I spoke about sequences and the right growing index problem, what I really is the underlying problem in a way is the 
avoid, uh, write contention. Now, right growing index still has another aspect to it because we need to manage the index in a particular way if it really if it's really right growing. But in general, what you want to avoid is right contention. So if you see that you know your application leads to a pattern by which there's a frequent transactional change to the same and presumably a small data set, then what will happen is that small data that the set may potentially be shipped between instances in the rack database very often. And that in, is not a good start to, to, to provide or write a, a scalable application. So write contention is a bit of a problem in, in, a, in a distributed system such as rack. However, it's very easy to tailor to. There are certain things I'll talk about later in a minute, in a minute but if you develop a new application, which is all what this chapter is about, speaking to developers' productivity, well, SQL optimization really gets you the best here. If you can optimize your SQL so that you avoid frequent transactional changes to the same or small data set, you will get the best result out of it. And as you're developing a new application, that may be the best way to do it. That may be something that you may want to consider as a developer to optimize your new applications. That doesn't mean you have to. We will see this in chapter number two, integrated scalability, because in this chapter, I'm going to talk about rack scaling. And for all that matters, rack has scaled the most complex enterprise workloads nearly linearly, as I said before, for decades. And we are constantly improving. So that's why I'm not so worried about the right contention all the time, because we have seen that even a certain amount of right contention, which happens in enterprise workloads, for example, as well, is tolerable by rack and can be mitigated with other um, aspects than just SQL tuning. Because the thing with enterprise applications is that oftentimes you don't have access to the source code. And if you don't have access to the source code, well, SQL optimization may be not a thing that is easily to be implemented. There are certain things you could do on the database only, but they may not be as good as having access to the source code. In absence of the same, you only are able to do the database optimization part of which, which still can yield some good improvement rates. So that's why write contention not being ideal, heavy write contention really being bad, but in enterprise applications, normally we have seen it works out in the end. And if it doesn't, you'll see later 19C does much better there. So that said, rack scales that most complex enterprise workload because of many reasons. One of the reasons is that we have always made sure that we address these kind of workloads. We have worked with eBusiness Suite, which is our own solution. We have worked with SAP um, to make sure that their applications run on rack. They have also done so for uh, Oracle hospi Hospitality. Now, one other aspect of this is, and that kind of comes logical if you think about it, is Rack has always made sure that we scale any new feature, that we work with any new feature. For example, when placable databases were announced back in 12C, Rack was one of the first ones to adopt that feature. I have done a presentation with the placable uh, database PM at the time talking about how these two solutions complement each other. The same for Oracle in memory. Oracle in memory in memory database is a great addition to the Oracle database and REC helps it to provide available solutions. The scaling is pretty good and in memory already, but what we need to do with REC is, and we do this particularly on Exadata, we make sure that your in-memory cache will be available on another instance should the one instance die. And then there's a bunch of customs applications that customers have developed against REC, and we have seen that those scale as well. Now, the benefit of those is that you normally can adapt um, the application. So the bottom line is that Rack has scaled most complex workload without need, the need to change the application. And especially on database, uh, Exadata database machines, because we are very tightly integrated there. These are just a few customers that have used Oracle Rack for all sorts of workloads. We have scaled with Oracle Rack OLTP data warehouse and hybrid, meaning to say transactional and analytical processing workloads across all of these um, customers to a varying degree, but all of them have been using Rack for some sort of workload and combination thereof. One of the ones that I want to point out to is PayPal. PayPal is probably known to everyone here on the call. It's one of the most major payment platforms in the world. For sure, it is in the US. 
And um, they have recently done a webcast paper with our friend Anil, who is on the call here. And they have spoken to PayPal's needs and requirements. And we have shown in this webcast, Anil, and um, our friends from PayPal, PayPal have shown in this webcast how um, Rack has helped them to scale within a Rack instance by adding Rack instances and even to achieve uh, better availability by providing rolling upgrades with zero downtime, which I will speak to in a minute. If you're interested in seeing this webcast, I've given you the URL over here. You can see the replay. I unfortunately missed the live, um, the live version, but Anil can certainly answer some questions um, to the technical part of which in, in the chat today. Now, PayPal has been using Rack for a while, and these cooperations with PayPal, who have very high scale requir scaling requirements. I mean, as I said, it's a really huge payment platform. They have been growing year over year for a long time. So they really have a demand for scaling. We have not only provided PayPal and other customers, of course, and therefore you, um, with new scalability features, we have also taken their input and help design new scalability features in the Oracle database, but more importantly, in Oracle Rack. And as you can see here in my little um, brochure, Rack is rather old. It came out with 9i, that was in 2001, with Cache Fusion. And why a lot of people think Cache Fusion hasn't done anything ever since, that is wrong. We have been constantly improving Cache Fusion. So the 9i Rack, compared to the 21c Rack that you would see on the top of this arrow, very different, very different. So we have put so many scalability and performance features really in general into the Rack database over all these releases that you can see here. And this is probably not even a complete list yet. That the difference between the performance that you see in 9i, 10g or 11g, in 11.2 even, is not the same. You will see much better scalability starting with Oracle Rack 19c. For which reason I strongly recommend you go to 19C if your intention is to optimize scalability. We have done, for example, a lot in the area of contention rich workloads improvements. So the right contention that I mentioned before, we have given a lot of thought um, into 19C to make it so that Rack scales despite um, a right contention. So if you have such a problem and you are still before 19C, an upgrade to 19C may already be the solution that you're looking for. Now, some of the features that I've listed here, I have already spoken to and most of which I can't speak to. There are a few ones such as confusion or parallel execution and the RDM usage that I wanna briefly touch up on. For example, regarding Cache Fusion, I said before, Cache Fusion, has been with Rack for the longest time, has been with Rack for 20 years. However, Cache Fusion has always been ahead of its time. And it continues to be so because we are continuously improving it. One of the examples which I want to make here, and I took this example also from the webcast uh, as well as from Anil slides, Rack scales with hundreds of instances. Officially, we support 100 database instances in a cluster. We could probably support more if you wanted to. We have tested with more. It does scale because scaling a rack is not dependent on the number of nodes. Um, that is also illustrated here in the picture. But frankly, we don't need to scale more than 100 nodes. A lot of other databases show that they can support 200, 300 nodes in a database cluster to scale. Well, besides the fact that this is a nightmare to manage, in Oracle Rack, it's not required. You don't need so many nodes. You can run the same workload that you run on 200 nodes of other databases, which use you know, mostly um, perhaps sharding for that matter or other means of scaling. You can run the same workload on a very much smaller set of subset and instances in a Rack cluster. That's why 100 is more than sufficient. I, do not any, I don't, don't know any customer that has a 100 node Rack cluster because there is no customer that has that kind of workload that requires so many instances. A big Rack cluster these days, these days, would be 60 nodes already, especially when you go to Exadata database machine. Now, cache, and, and one reason for that is Cache Fusion optimizes how data is shipped for OLTP workload, for example. I will make this quick. In general, no matter where the data, the application is connected, I spoke to this before, 
the data needs to be delivered to this session, which is the result of the connection. And the data that the session needs to work on needs to be delivered to that session, meaning to that instance into the buffer cache. Cache Fusion does this in the most efficient way. If the data is already in the buffer cache, then we have what it's called a local access, and that will be a nanosecond access, no doubt about it. Now, it could happen that the data isn't in the cache in which the session is connected to, or to which the session is connected to. Then we need to ship the data that's requested, and we talk about here as a block shipping, from either the other instance or from disk. And REC will make the determination what, what will be happening at the moment it's required. Normally, we would ship from a remote cache, and that will take microseconds. But it could be that sometimes data has not been in another cache and needs to be going straight from disk. Or it would be more efficient to load a lot of data from disk than to assemble it by taking some pieces from the remote cache, some from the local, and some from the storage. Cache Fusion will make um, that determination dynamically. It will determine the best pass in no time, and therefore deliver the data in the most efficient way at the moment it's needed to where it's needed. And all this works because we don't grow, or we don't um, increase access latency when we increase the size of the cluster. No matter how many nodes in the cluster you have, to obtain one piece of data, you would never need to communicate with more than three instances, never. In addition to that, we can do function shipping via parallel ex execution, which is, you know, you can do outsource some work to other nodes, which we will call, talk about now. As I mentioned before, um, parallel execution is a, a concept that we have in the Oracle database, which is very old, it works vertically and it works horizontally, which means in Rack, parallel execution, read and writes can help to use all the CPU cores in your cluster. You can split up the work and allocate some of the work to another instance and therefore parallelize fully across the nodes in the cluster using all the CPU work, uh, CPU cores that you have available in the cluster to you. We use what it's called an orchestrator for that purpose so you have one orchestrator on one node and then it divides up the work and gives slaves or server parallel server processes we should not be using the word slave anymore um, to the other instances in the cluster and once they have done their work they return the result to the orchestrator and the work is delivered back to the application that requested it it works seamlessly well meaning to say this works completely transparent to the application you can change the degree to which you want to parallelize in your cluster on the database. You don't need to do anything in the application for it. So it's very dynamical. So this is where you know, the DBAs can speed up a little bit the work perhaps for some applications without the developers even knowing. And then of course, we have a tight integration with Oracle Dex, uh, Exadata database machine. I don't think I need to go into much greater detail on this. There is a perfect presentation that you can review if you are interested in it. Anil Nair on his slide share has a presentation that is called Oracle Rack Features on Exadata. And there you get them all. But in general, what I wanna highlight here is that Oracle Rack and Exadata have been designed for each other. And I'm not even kidding. Um, Rack has been tailored to Exadata and Exadata to running Rack to the degree that we have loads and loads of integration features that you wouldn't be getting on generic hardware because we can't deliver it there. Uh, and that makes Exadata the most optimized and integrated platform for Oracle Rack. I don't think I need to tell that anyone here on the call. And therefore, you oftentimes also see new features coming out on Exadata first. I know that sometimes look like we want to prefer Exadata, but oftentimes it's the result of we can't deliver it somewhere else, or we need to gain experience in a very defined environment before we can deliver it somewhere else. And the latter is probably true for RDMA. We will have way more RDMA support on Exadata than we have now in future. And we do this because we really want to see how direct memory access works across instances in that very defined environment. So right now, there's a bunch of RDMA features that are available on Exadata, which you can't get on in generic yet. I don't know, I'm not gonna promise, but it may be worthwhile looking into that. Now, that brings me to point number three, seamless high availability. Unfortunately, I should have been much faster by that time. So let me see that I can seamlessly speed it up a little bit. 
So seamless high availability for RAC means that we should have the best level, the highest level of high availability, and that is exactly that we have been delivering. In general, we have promised with Aura Correct that when an instance dies in the cluster or a node dies in the cluster, that your general impact on the applications would be less than 60 seconds and certain parts of the application wouldn't even notice it because um, they, they, they are doing work on other nodes that, aren't even, that isn't even affected. This reconfiguration time though, when a node an instance dies and we need to do some instance recovery for it, that reconfiguration time has been improved significantly between 11G and 19C. You can see the features and the times here, but in general, what I want to point out, if you have an 11.2 database, REC database that is, and your reconfiguration time is around, let's say 40 seconds, just by going to 12C, you should be four times faster. If it's a, you're going from 11.2 to 19C, your reconfiguration time should be seven times faster. So if you're at 40 seconds in the first place, you should be at the sevens of that. Now, not always that will work exactly um, as I just said. It depends a little bit on the workload and we use various features for it, as you can see listed on the right here. But in general, we believe that in 19C, the reconfiguration time will be much, much faster than you have seen before. And actually, we know this also because we have worked with PayPal. PayPal has very high demands, as you can imagine, on failover times being low, on reconfiguration times low. And in general, they have a zero downtime requirement. Guess what? According to their slide, and I have no doubt to believe it as we work with them very closely, they have achieved zero downtime, at least for rack rolling patches. So remember, availability can affect the failures as much as it can affect plant maintenance. And for plant maintenance, the benefit is that you know when it's going to be happening. And PayPal has tailored their operations and used certain features and rack in such an efficient way that for rolling patches or for maintenance operations, they have achieved zero downtime. But what they have also got is because that was one of their major requirements is a much better reconfiguration time in terms of um, brownout times, the times when a node dies and we need to recover it as defined, compared to 11.2. As you can see here, the numbers in 11G, nothing been done, we have, you know, rec reconfiguration times around 50 seconds. So I wasn't too far off with my former example. If you then use what we call DRM optimized, and, and Anil can tell you all about it, and he has probably talked about it in one of his slides, you get around 20 seconds brownout time. With 19C, where we have integrated all these features in, uh, that we had in 11.2 and later ones, you get out of the box less than 10 seconds, at least in PayPal's case, Let's be clear about it. So, you know, your, your, your workload may be slightly different, but if our improvements can have such a significant improvement for PayPal, I'm sure you might see some benefit from those two in your environment. The other aspect that I wanna highlight here is that we're not only faster in recovering from failures, we are also much better these days in protecting your application from seeing a failure. And the one number one feature that is to be named here is application continuity. Application continuity basically protects um, your application from outages. And as we are presenting this presentation as part of an MAA presentation, and one of the presentations will be dedicated to application continuity, I'll make this very quick here. If you as a developer would like not to worry about recovering or even seeing an outage on the database, application Continuity is exactly your friend, is exactly the feature that you would like to use. It works in two ways. You can use application continuity, which means you need to use an Oracle pool and you can customize it, which may be interesting to some developers. Or um, you can use transparent application continuity, which works without um, Oracle pools, but um, it therefore makes some decisions for you. Both of these solutions will help a an application not see an outage, even if this application had transactions in flight, uncommitted transaction and an outage occurred because uh, application continuity, especially transparent application continuity, will continue those transactions for you and make it so appear that they are completed on the failover instance and therefore your application doesn't get an error. 
That sounds good, though with transparent application continuity it may happen to some degree, and that some degree can easily be determined by a tool called AC check. So if you are interested in application continuity and what it can do for you, um, AC check, you run a report while you run the application, and AC check will tell you which of the operations in your applications will or maybe not be recovered or continued by application continuity. There's different stages in which we do this. I have planned on explaining those here. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So when Ian Cookson comes up with application continuity as part of the series, please do ask him all about it and how you can benefit from it. Ian, by the way, is also the Oracle Cluster Rare PM, and I'm also only saying this because let's not forget here that the Rack stack is based on grid infrastructure, and grid infrastructure has ASM and Cluster Rare combined. Between the two of them, grid infrastructure provides a complete clustering solution. So when I have been talking today about protecting the database, protecting the application from seeing an error, Let's not forget that you can very easily use Oracle Clusterware to protect your application in terms of a failover equally as well, right? And this is what this talks about. So if you really want to have a protection for your application from the application server failing over to the database not failing and not getting an error in between, you can all do this with the components we have in the Rack stack. But we have even more. As we know that the world is changing, meaning workload is changing constantly, and so are systems, we have two components in the rack stack that I briefly want to touch up on, um, and then you can perhaps read up on, or we can do another presentation if you'd like. One is the data database reliability framework. The other one is the autonomous health framework, both of which provide what I would call adaptive protection. So the database reliability framework detects changes of workload in the database and performs corrective adoption, should I just say, for it. So for example, you may find out that the situation, uh, the workload situation in the database requires that we need to change the DRM setting, dynamic remastering settings. Then the reliability framework will do so and may um, you know, even temporarily disable or lower the threshold for DRM. On the other hand, the whole cluster of, uh, sometimes may be subject to an impact, may be subject to a slowdown. This is for where autonomous health framework comes in. This framework monitors the cluster components in the cluster and uses components of the cluster to do so for you to get a continuous availability, not only for the database, but for your system as a whole. And as much as I try to speak up, I think I need five minutes more because I have two more topics to make. Luckily, it gets easier later because as I said, by now you should probably see what I'm going for under five. But let's briefly talk about four isolated consolidation, consolidation for converged use cases. I spoke about use cases all along this presentation and normally we distinguish between OLTP data warehouse analytics or a hybrid or combination thereof. What we have found in Oracle is that use cases, however, converge. Pretty much as use cases have converged, meaning combined in real world. I'm looking into my phone, in my mobile phone, which acts as my camera webcam today to speak to you. And later on, I will use the same phone to do my emails. I will do the same phone to check my to check the, to check the stock market. I will do a lot of things which a phone originally wasn't designed to do because it was ma ma majorly done uh, used to make phone calls. Nowadays, I use my phone for a lot of things, less as so actually to make phone calls because nowadays everything is on Zoom. And even Zoom can be used on my mobile phone. So you can see how use cases converge and we have found the same happens to the database in that different workloads, different data types all need to be used and served in a central place. Well, they don't need to be. You could have dedicated databases for each use case. You can have a machine learning, JSON, blockchain database. You can have a database for graphs. You can have a database for um, warehousing and you can all separate it out. But if you do so, you will encounter a lot of ETL and operation between database systems. That isn't very efficient. As a developer, and I hope you, know, you can affiliate with this, it would be much and dramatically simpler if you could just invoke an extended SQL 
to get access to all of these data types, to all of these use cases. If you could use extended SQL to execute machine learning, to execute or ask for graph data, to ask for spatial data, to access blockchain data or insert something into a blockchain, and the same goes for Internet of Things workloads. If you had the possibility to do this via one extended uh, SQL and two um, a converged database, you would be way more efficient doing this. And this is exactly where Oracle's converged database comes in. Our idea is to use the Oracle database and converge all these use cases into one and the same. The converged database, if you have heard about it, is not a new database. It's not even a new version of the database. You can do this with 19C very easily. You could do this before, but 19C has a few features that tailor to it. No, the converged database is really the idea, the Oracle converged database is really the idea to combine these workloads in the most efficient way. Now, as you do so, as you combine, converge, consolidate more than one workload on your database, the next question, however, arises for the paranoid availability engineer. Well, how are, do I ensure availability and scalability of these workloads? Now, the good thing is Oracle has done two things that help with this. We have introduced Oracle multi-tenant, or also known as blockable databases, a long time ago with 12C. And you can put these different workloads that you now would put on a converged database, such as you know, JSON reporting or spatial data, into different PDBs. And as you do so, you already get a whole lot of a isolation because especially in 19C, we have more and 21C even more so, we have isolated PDBs. So we have increased the isolation of PDBs within one container. And secondly, you get a lot of lifecycle operation improvements that you can benefit if you need to move one of the workload or one or two of the workloads around. If you now use REC with those PDBs as shown on the right side of my picture here, you have the perfect combination. You can scale you can scale the whole set of PDBs or individual ones because RAC has been incorporated with multi tenant a long time ago. And we have even provided what I called um, PDB isolation or correct with 12.2 already. So as you have PDBs in RAC, you can benefit from all the scaling, all the availability, and you maintain a very, very high degree of isolation. For example, we never talk to PDBs that are not open in more than one instance. If you have a PDB that's only open in one rack instance, there's no messaging to this PDB, so there's no chatter. So there's lesser of a noisy neighbor problem. If you have a PDB that's open only in one um, instance, such as the spatial one in my previous example, if that one PDB fails or you stop it, there's no impact whatsoever specifically also on failure, on any other PDB in the cluster. So you get a real isolation from workload um, impact here. And that is because we have integrated PDB into the benefits, but also into the isolation concept in RAC. And let's not forget, and here I'm talk, uh, let's not forget, and here I'm probably talking more to the managers, you get three user-defined PDBs for free in Oracle Single Instance Enterprise Edition, starting with 19C. So if you wanna consolidate three workloads, you can do this without having to purchase the rack, pardon me, without having to purchase the multi-tenant option in your Enterprise Edition. If you then would want to consolidate further, you could have, for example, three CDBs, container databases, with each one having three PDBs, as shown in my middle picture, on one server. And yet you would not have incurred any multi-tenant option requirement. Only once you start combining more than three user-defined um, PDBs in one database, that however includes a REC database for which this is more likely, you will have to think about purchasing the Oracle multi-tenant option. So you have a very flexible way of managing your consolidation costs here. Which brings me to my last topic, and I promise I will not go much further than the five minutes I asked for um, delay, perhaps. Full flexibility. And you already got an idea here, right? The, the multi-tenant part showed it to you, but I want to show you two other aspects here. Not only can you define when to consolidate and how, and how you go forward with this, you can also improve high availability as demand requires this. Starting with the developer early on, um, you know, if you de deploy an application, 
you may only do this first on a sound foundation use a single instance because you're just developing. However, as your application grows or your project grows or your company, if you're founding a startup grows, you know, you may find more demand on your application. You may find that this needs to be more available. You may have to spread it out to test systems. That's where pluggable databases come in. You take a pluggable database, you can do a lifecycle online migration, and then you put your pluggable databases, for example, in a red cluster. You work with your kind and nice DBA. You're asking for a red cluster, asking for a destination, and your pluggable database that was formerly one in a single instance becomes now part of a red cluster and therefore fully enjoys the high availability and scalability that I have been talking about for the last 45 minutes. Now, if you really grow out and or you want to you know, protect yourself from disasters, you can easily do this as much as you did before. At any point in time, you can add disaster recovery by means of data guard to a rec database or a single instance database if you so choose. And that also allows you then to get the benefits of high uh, of scalable read replicas. So really what I'm saying here is, and that is perhaps again, something that addresses managers, DBAs should already know this and developers don't need to. You can combine solutions in the Oracle database for scalability and high availability as needed. For example, but what is important to realize here is if you have Oracle database and the Oracle rec option, you get a lot of choices. Just, just look at it. You get single instance, you get rec, you get rec one node, you can combine REC with data guard, and as long as you know you don't use active data guard, you still have only REC and REC option as a license. And then you could even, if you have this very specific use case where you want to do sharding, you could even protect your shards with a REC database. And the REC option, the REC option includes sharding as well. Three shards are included in single instance for free, pretty much like the pluggable database case. If you have more than three shards, you would have to purchase the sharding option, but get what? The sharding option is included, and there's actually no sharding option. The sharding costs option are included in Oracle Rec. So with Oracle single instance or enterprise edition plus the REC option, um, you get a lot of choices on how you can scale or make your application available. And once you have made your choice and you have made your choice on premises or in the cloud, it doesn't matter. You can choose the same solutions with Oracle on the cloud as you have been doing it on premises for the longest time. So cloud, no cloud on premises, as long as you have an Oracle database, the same solutions are available to you on premises and in the Oracle cloud. There may be exceptions on other clouds, but for the Oracle cloud, we are fully committed to combine and provide the same solutions you would find otherwise on, prom on premises. And these were basically the top five reasons to deploy your application on Oracle Rack. Now, this was a long presentation. I probably overstate my welcome. So let me make a quick uh, summary and let me just give you one reason why you should be using Rack for your applications. Oracle is Oracle Rack. Oracle Rack is a proven, highly available, scalable Oracle cloud native database solution. And it really covers a lot of use cases. I don't think, having seen so many being covered, that there is yet a use case that is completely impossible to run on Rack. Of course, you may have to optimize a little bit here and there. You may have to tailor to some degree, but I'm pretty sure Oracle Rack runs all the use cases of the world given some assumptions, but we have seen that, that, that it has run enterprise workloads very well for the longest time, and I believe it'll continue that way. Now, for those of you who have been familiar with Rack, there's one customer that I want to quote here that said, if you have not looked into the new generation Oracle Rack 19C yet, you have not experienced what Oracle Rack can do for you. And that is perhaps a message that I want to leave you today with. Check out Rack. If you have Rack, you had had some issues in the past, please do check Oracle Rack 19C. It has a lot of features and a lot of improvements. And for any new applications, do consider Rack because it will continue to innovate. And with that said, I'm very happy that you stayed so long with me. I have overstayed my welcome. Back to you, sir. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much, Marcus. Um... Anil is actually answering almost 20 plus questions <laughs> behind the scenes. Uh, Anil, you want to uh, bring up any good question uh, uh, or maybe just to before closing? 
Yes. So um, one of the questions that I really uh, liked is about this new Oracle um, uh, Rack 19C and advanced queuing. So I will try to get some more details on that. I provided the white paper. So that is uh, something very good. Um, the other thing that I was asked uh, quite a lot is about uh, session failover. I will make sure I will convey to Ian uh, to cover it in a lot more detail. Uh, I have answered it uh, as much as I could uh, in the short time in the Q&A, but we will cover that in a little bit more detail in the uh, application continuity session. That's all. Super, yeah. Super, that is yeah. the good thing of having a, a series, I guess. We can always pick up your feedback and, and ask the other presenters to, to address it. Thank you, Anil. Yeah, thank you so much, Marcus, uh, covering detailed session on Oracle Rack. Uh, I think lots of information to digest. Um, that's what I'm feeling, at least myself. Uh, again, thanks, Anil, for answering all the questions in the, in the background. Uh, um, I think thank you is a very small word, but uh, appreciate your time and support. Uh, this summit is going to help us, uh, especially uh, please participants, uh, please work on your all your burning questions and you know all the nine sessions, um, uh, the eight sessions are coming up, right? So look at the titles, look at the abstract, uh, look at the speaker and keep all your questions ready because this is the only way you can connect with uh, the speakers. And, you know, I think I never had this opportunity when I was a DBA, right? So we only look at the documentation and uh, nothing else. But uh, nowadays we have access to the entire team and, you know, it's a really great and they are supporting us, right? So, and also we know this is late for many of us. Uh, also, it is early for speakers. Um, let us dedicate some time to for learning. Um, let's see. Um, um, for the next slide. <clears throat> so thank you. Please connect with us on Telegram. That is the very quickest way to answer all your questions. And as you know, uh, you know this is like a uh, nine series, and we have done one one today. And I think uh, it's very important that you know please uh, the same moment in all the all the sessions. Uh, make sure that you share with your connections and uh, bring more people more people, more questions, more knowledge, right? That's the uh, mantra we always follow. Uh, so before closing, uh, Marcus, Anil, you want to say something about this summit or? Yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll click. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to present this summit. Um, MAA, Maximum Availability Architecture, is an architecture very old at Oracle. And so I assume a lot of you know some of it, we are intending to give you the latest on all the technologies that are um, under the MMA umbrella. REC is one of them. You see the other ones here. We also talk about zero downtime migration, which is a cloud migration tool in this context. And yeah, please do join our speakers, do join our sessions. We are more than happy to um, ask, uh, answer all the questions we can, or as you can see today, we'll take them forward if they can be addressed in another question. So really, I am uh, very looking forward to spending time with you virtually this August. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity, AAUG and Sai. Yes, I would like to just continue uh, what Marcus said. So we keep thinking about individual products like Rack and DataGuard. I think this MAA Summit gives you like a whole 360 degree uh, introduction and details about the entire end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, how do you protect your application? How do you protect your data against disaster recovery, against, you know, local uh, issues, storages, um, and all those different aspects, which is very important. And I'm, thank you again, Sai, for, you know, giving us this opportunity. Uh, hope you join us for the future sessions. And until then, please keep the feedback coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, once again, Marcus and Anil. Um, so, guys, I think it's up to a, um, it's your, your job to ask all your burning questions. I know if we have any issues with Oracle Rack and this is the right time, right? Please keep all your questions and share with your connections. Uh, with that, uh, have a wonderful rest of the day for uh, US folks. <laughs> and for India, it's a good night for everyone. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.